Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dakshita Ratnaika, and I'm an enterprise architect at WSO2. So today I'm going to talk about API-driven microservice architecture that will help you uh, empower digital transformation at speed. Um, I'm sure you know where I'm heading with this analogy. So um, I'm going to talk about pebbles and boulders. So pebbles, as opposed to a 1,000 ton boulder, are easier to handle. Right? You can easily uh, group, uh, sort the pebbles, or collect them, and carry them around, and do whatever you want. Try doing that with a 1,000 ton boulder easily, effortlessly. So moving your cloud, uh, moving your applications uh, to the cloud should be as easy as walking down the beach, collecting a bunch of pebbles, uh, putting it into uh, a bucket, and taking them wherever you need to. So you can't do that with the monolith or the boulder, uh, which represents the monolith. So the monolith application is pretty much a sedimented consists of sedimented layers of uh, redundant logic and um, features, which translates into thousands of lines of code um, based, on, uh, based on an outdated programming language, um, based on uh, outdated software architecture principles. So today's talk is about how microservice architecture is a good approach to building decentralized systems. Um, but microservices are too granular when it comes to architecting larger systems. So in order to better manage your microservices, you should use the API gateway pattern. Um, and based on the API gateway pattern, you can uh, follow these architecture approaches that I'm going to cover today, which are the layered architecture and the cell-based architecture approaches. And I will show you how to um, implement these architecture approaches using open source technologies. OK, please excuse me. I'm going to get rid of the mic. OK, so just to get an idea, um, maybe by a show of hands, how many of you have microservices implementations already? OK, great. So um, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. So some of the issues with direct client to microservice communication is that um, so if the client applications have to talk to microservices directly, uh, you are going to face the issues that uh, the ESP try to solve uh, in an SOA architecture. So you are going to end up with a point-to-point -point spaghetti integration mess, right? And also, if the client applications don't want, um, don't get the response they need from the microservices, then they will have to call several microservices to get what they need, right? And microservices, by principle, are owned by um, you know, an individual team. They can be based on various technologies. Um, so there won't be a uniform interface or protocols to consume these microservices. So these are some of the issues. And also, when you are exposing your microservice to the client applications, you have to think about security, throttling, um, caching, and things like that. So if each of these microservices are going to implement that logic, then uh, that is going to be duplicated all over the place. And also, the microservice won't be micro per se. So because of these reasons, it's, it doesn't make sense to um, implement direct client to microservice communication. That means doesn't make sense for client applications to talk to microservices directly. So instead, use the API gateway, or uh, go ahead with the API gateway pattern. So in the API gateway pattern, you have uh, the API gateway as an entry point um, to access your microservices. So the API gateway will contain well-defined APIs, REST APIs, or uh, well-defined APIs that can expose your microservices, and it can uh, basically uh, uh, enforce security, throttling, and other API management features. So the API gateway is usually a part of an API management offering. 
So here's a WSO2 solution pattern. Um, so I've mapped the products, uh, the WSO2 products that you can use to implement the API gateway. So the WSO2 API gateway can be used as the API gateway. It's a part of the WSO2 API management offering. And um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the open source WSO2 API manager. Right, so this is, uh, here you can see the API ecosystem here. Um, so the API manager consists of several components, and you have um, these components uh, segregated into a management plane, a data plane, and a control plane. So you get, um, okay, let's just talk about the development aspect. So you have your API developers who have, who are your microservice developers. They want to expose the microservices as managed APIs. So they can come to the API publisher portal or even use command line tools to publish their APIs in the developer portal. So if you want um, application developers, client application developers to discover your APIs, um, they can come to the developer portal and discover them. So the application developers will basically uh, browse through the APIs or they can search for a particular API, find information about how to access them, and then subscribe to them and get a security token so that they can um, uh, use that token in the application so that the end users can access that backend microservice. So we also have a control plane, which consists of a key manager, a traffic manager, and um, an analytics component. So the key manager is pretty much in charge of uh, issuing and managing uh, tokens. And the traffic manager can uh, enforce um, throttling and basically control traffic. And the anomaly detection or the analytics component can uh, provide business insight to stakeholders and also uh, trigger alerts if you want to uh, detect, if, if, if any anomalies are detected. So the API gateway is a runtime component. Um, so the API consumers or the application users, when they're accessing these microservices, they will have to come to the API gateway. So they will access the APIs in the API gateway. And these API, uh, the API gateway will talk to the control plane verify the, uh, basically validate the OAuth2 token with the key manager and also check if any, if the traffic quota has been violated or not and then dispatch that request to the backend microservice. So that's the API managers, WS2 API managers, API management offering and you can use the API gateway, WS2 API gateway as the API gateway. Okay, so um, we had the API gateway but think about, um, the legacy applications or the services that you can't, or the legacy services that you can't get rid of. So um, there may be systems that can't be transformed into microservices overnight. It'll take some time, or maybe that's so important you can't exactly get rid of those. So there has to be a way to talk to them. You can't, so I mean, this is a PowerPoint architecture, right? It's easy for me to say that these microservices you can just write your microservices, create your API gateway, and then just you know build your application. But if you want to access your legacy data, um, applications, and other legacy services, there should be a way to still talk to them. So sometimes an API gateway um, might not be able to do all of that. It can do simple transformations and just um, you know do the API management stuff. But what if it has to do more? What if it needs to talk to all those services? So then uh, what you can do is introduce a second layer uh, of microservices. And these can be integration microservices. So the task of these integration microservices are to basically integrate your microservices and integrate with other applications. So that's what that does. So it basically is like introducing an ESV architecture, but it's not centralized. So uh, here's the solution mapping from WSO2. So you can use, uh, there are two options. One is to use Ballerina for your integrations or use the micro integrator for your integrations. So let me introduce you to those technologies. So Ballerina was just released. 1.0 was released this week, early this week. And it's, a, it's an open source cloud native programming language. It's a, general purpose programming language. Um, 
it's purposely built for integrations, right? So, and um, it has optimized features to build network distributed applications. And uh, you can um, create your concurrent network distributed uh, integrations using a sequence diagram. So you can either code using the Ballerina uh, language, and that will get mapped to uh, a sequence diagram. Or you can basically create your sequence diagram and map it to a code. Uh, so that's uh, about Ballerina, just a very brief introduction. Please check it out on ballerina.io, and um, you can get more information. So in addition to, so that's the Ballerina programming language. So we also have uh, the WSO2 Enterprise e Integrator. 7.0 is going to be released in, uh, in a couple of weeks. So it's a hybrid integration platform. So the Enterprise Integrator is the previous version. It was an ESP. Um, and uh, what we have now is that's going to be released is going to be um, a hybrid integration platform. So you can, it offers two ways of uh, creating your microservices, integration microservices. So one way is by using the Ballerina integrator, that's a separate runtime, and the micro integrator. So if you want to create integration microservices using code first integration style using the Ballerina programming language, then you can use the Ballerina integrator. But if you prefer um, the classic ESB style integration where you um, use maybe drag and drop editors and then create a a flow, basically, if you're used to that sort of uh, integration, uh, you can use the configuration first integration style and uh, use the micro integrator. So the Ballerina integrator is more than just the Ballerina language. So it's based on Ballerina. It comes with an installer, a sequence diagram, visualization tool, uh, key Ballerina add-ons, etc., And uh, it comes with some predefined integration platforms. Uh, sorry, templates. So you need to use the Ballerina integrator in order to have access to those. Uh, the micro integrator is the cloud native variant of the open source WSO2 ESP. So it supports all the ESP features. It's just that it's lightweight and it can front uh, one or two microservices. Um, so it comes with graphical data flow designer tool. So here you can see the difference in the editors. So the Ballerina integrator, you can just basically code your integrations. Uh, your network distributed integrations, and then uh, you can see uh, this is the corresponding sequence diagram. And with the micro integrator, you can just drag and drop and use the classic uh, integration approach to create your integrations. All right, so okay, we create we had the gateway, and then we created the my integration microservices as a second layer uh, to do uh, complex complex transformations and uh, in, to integrate with legacy applications. So if you want to scale uh, your gateways, you can use the micro gateway. So um, if you want to, um, so let's assume some of your microservices have to be scaled to uh, address certain um, traffic volumes. Uh, so then what you can do is, uh, if you use the micro gateway, these can be scaled independently and then uh, they are disconnected from the rest of the control, controller plane components. Uh, that's made possible because the micro gateway can self-validate the tokens. Uh, it has in-memory throttling, and it can do offline analytics. So with the monolithic uh, API gateway, it was always connected to these control plane uh, components. And hence, you couldn't really um, scale the gateways alone. Uh, without scaling the rest of the components. So this way you can scale the micro gateways. And for that, you can use the, the cloud native variant of the API manager's gateway, which is the micro gateway. So you can use the micro gateway uh, for the micro gateways, the dis uh, decentralized gateways here. All right, so we talked about how you use the gateway, and then you can use integration microservices and then use uh, decentralized gateways. So that all led to a layered microservice architecture. So here you can see that, um, uh, so this is what we discussed, and the API services will be the edge services. They are what will be consumed by the client applications, and the composite services or the integration services will contain the integration logic 
and the core services or the atomic services will be the microservices, the core microservices, which will contain your business logic. Okay, so that was all good as long as it was, you know, a bunch of microservices, not too many, maybe um, tens of them, maybe even hundreds. But um, let's take a look at Uber's microservice graph, uh, which was taken from a conference, uh, a talk uh, at a conference earlier this year. So um, I don't know how it works internally, but this is their microservice graph. And it's kind of scary because it's not just about the number of dots which represent the microservices, but it's also about the connections. It's, um, you know, it's, there are so many connections and it, it just looks like there could be a, you know, it, governance can be challenging when it comes to so many microservices. So if you are looking at managing your microservices uh, better when it comes to a high number of microservices, then an approach you could follow is cell-based microservice architecture. So uh, cell-based microservice architecture is uh, a microservice architecture pattern, which pretty much um, um, uh, basically dictates that your microservices, um, data, and um, other functional components can be grouped into uh, cohesive, independently deployable architecture units called cells. So it's really, um, it's about, you know, giving, uh, it's about grouping your microservices, giving better management to teams so that they can do their own uh, API management and also be in control of the services they're in charge of. So it allows you to group your services, microservices better and provide control around them and uh, mm -hmm. basically uh, manage your microservices better. So these are self-contained and they're deployable as a unit, they're API-centric, and um, yeah, so that's pretty much that. And this is the cell-based architecture at a glance, if you're looking at all your microservices um, grouped into cells. Um, so here you can see that each of these uh, microservices and other components can be directly accessed within a cell. So it does not have to, uh, uh, the internal communication does not have to happen through a gateway. You can have direct um, communication, but if you want to uh, talk to a microservice outside the cell, then you will have to talk to that cell's API gateway. So this is um, one way of um, managing your microservices. So more details about cell-based architecture. So a cell is an immutable application component, and it's built, deployed, updated, and managed individually as a complete unit. So it consists of multiple services. It can be serverless um, components or microservices, uh, and the managed API is the front-end API gateway, um, fronting API gateway. You can also have ingress, egress policies, security trust domains, et cetera. And like I mentioned, uh, inter intracell communication will happen directly, and intercell communication will happen through the cell gateway. So cells are versioned, pushed, pulled, deployed, um, and you can use them as reuse reusable units of architecture. Okay, so okay, you might think, okay, we saw the cells, but how are we supposed to implement all of that? Um, so especially on if you're implementing it on Kubernetes, that's like writing a lot of YAML, um, YAML configuration. So you need to define all of that. So we came up with Celery. So uh, the WSO2 community is working on a framework called Celery, which allows you to implement um, a cell-based architecture on Kubernetes, right? So it's a combination of an SDK, a runtime, and a management framework. It can point to an existing Kubernetes cluster or Google, cl uh, Google Kubernetes engine. And you can create cells by writing uh, type safe compiled code with Celery. So you can, so if you want, now for example, if you take this cell, there are two components here, one microservice, so two microservices, a data, uh, another one. And you can write code uh, you can point to the images of these microservices and define that these are the components that will come within the cell 
and uh, define the cell gateway com uh, properties and things like that, and basically code your cell-based architecture. So here's how it is working, how it's supposed to work. So you write your cell description here, you build it using Celery, and you can create a cell image. And uh, you can push that cell image to Celery Hub. That's like Docker Hub, except it's a hub for cells. Um, and then during runtime, these cell images can be pulled, and your microservices that you defined in the cell description are now contained within um, cells, right? So you can create your cell-based architecture that way. And um, so during runtime, uh, the applications will have to talk to um, the cell gateway. If it's a web cell, then it will be the cell gateway. And then the web application will talk to the rest of the cell gateways in order to access the rest of the microservices. Yep. And then a Celery also comes with inbuilt um, capabilities to manage your cells. You can monitor them, trace, secure, and uh, control access. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Cell Gateway is built using the uh, WSO2 API uh, micro gateway. Yeah, you can define it. Um, so you point to, yeah. Yes. So, but when we say that there is a gateway, the celery within uh, the framework will spin up an API micro gateway. Okay, so in summary, um, microservice architecture is great but uh, microservices are too granular and need to be managed properly when it comes to architecting larger systems. So layered architecture is good for um, small to medium scale microservice projects, but if you want to uh, manage you know, thousands or hundreds even uh, of microservices, CBA or cell-based architecture is an emerging alternative that you can consider. Uh, and it can help at an organizational and DevOps level as well because you let teams manage the cells and it allows you to better group your microservices and manage them better. So for more information um, uh, regarding the API-driven microservice architecture, I have a white paper. And cell-based architecture, um, this is the link to the white paper. I'm assuming this uh, slide, the slide deck will be shared with you. Um, and motivations for a cell-based architecture, that's uh, also a good read. And also you can read my article on Celery, um, uh, why, on, on InfoQ, uh, and that's the link. So um, what you should do is uh, go ahead and use your pebbles or your microservices and uh, seize the day with microservices because there are ways to manage them. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, so I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. Any questions? Yes. So this cell-based architecture is there. So this gateway, how will it will store its uh, routing information or management information? So the routing information, uh, so uh, you can define all of that in your Celery code. Right and and define how everything has to be uh, routed. So all that is written in your Celery code. That's what you basically code using Celery. So it will be stored in Kubernetes etcd database, or it will be having its own database. Yeah. So it's based on Kubernetes. So you can use make use of etcd. That's what you do. Any other question? No. Okay. Thank you again. Actually. Thank you.